Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm so happy to welcome you to a very special Nature Hour featuring author, educator, and entomologist Doug Tallamy. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. And we launched Nature Hour this past summer with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community partners. The format of tonight's lecture is a 60 minute presentation followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to have them answered at the end of the presentation. In addition to tonight's lecture, we have two nature hours this fall, two additional nature hours this fall. On Wednesday, October 14th, we welcome Ryan Davis from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay for Tree Talk, identifying trees during any season. And on Wednesday, October 28th, we welcome Lancaster Conservancy's very own Senior Vice President of Land Protection, Kate Gonick, who will be pre presenting a lecture titled Saving History Through Land Protection. You can learn more and pre-register for these lectures on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. And on October 2nd, we're very excited to present Harvest Moon, a night for the Susquehanna River lands. Join us as we come together for the culmination of our fundraising efforts to protect the beautiful forest glens and streams along the Susquehanna River. This one hour live broadcast is a celebration of our work, a night full of meaningful moments of action and a little bit of laughter. We promise it'll be fun. Tonight I'm joined by my two incredible colleagues from our Community Impact Department, Kelly Snavely, our Director of Marketing and Communications, and Faith DeJong, our Development and Annual Fund Coordinator. We're also very excited to have Lancaster Conservancy's President, Phil Wenger, with us this evening, and I would like to invite Phil to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Fritz. I just want to add my incredibly warm words of welcome to you, all of you tonight. I wish we were all gathered together at Willow Valley like we had planned earlier this spring, uh, but it's wonderful that so many of you have chosen to join us tonight with this virtual learning experience. For me and all of our 2,500 supporters, the Conservancy is a really special place. Unlike most farm and land trusts who use conservation and farm easements to protect private land from development, the Lancaster Conservancy is very unique because we first and foremost go out and actually acquire the land. We raise the money, we buy it. Then we permanently protect it with easements and, and with uh, deed restrictions guaranteed by the state. And then we turn it back to the community to enjoy. And it's all of our nature preserves are open to the public. I want you to understand that what's unique is that we own this land and that comes with a lot of responsibility responsible to care for it, to keep it functioning ecologically, to have it clean our waterways, to have it store carbon, our trees, and, to, and a host of other ecological services. Today, the Conservancy owns 7,000 acres. We're the third largest land trust in the state of Pennsylvania in acres owned. They're in 47 nature preserves in Lancaster County and along the Susquehanna River in York County. I don't know if you like numbers, but we own 39 miles of streams and we support hundreds of miles of hiking trails, many of them along our long trails along the Susquehanna River. And if there's a trail and there's natural land beside it, we target that land in order to protect it so that when you're out hiking, you can experience the beauty of nature. We like to brag, we have a nature preserve within 10 miles of every Lancaster County resident. And we're excited because during this time of COVID, we have found more people than ever getting out into nature and appreciating and valuing our work. We believe that now is the time to make the case that we haven't protected nearly enough land for all the people who want to experience it. So people often ask me, why, why do we do this? Why is a private organization going out and acquiring land when public organizations like the state parks and our national parks are the ones that should be setting these special places aside? And I like to tell them, those government entities don't do this anymore. We do this for th recreation first. That includes hiking, hunting, fishing, and outdoor sports. 
And if you go to, if you travel to counties east of here, you can tell they've lost all this access. If you go to Delaware County or Montgomery County in the suburbs of Philadelphia, you will discover they don't have those large wooded areas that you can hike and fish and recreate. But the second reason that we do it is to protect habitat. I mean, our world literally right now is on a catastrophic decline of our biodiversity. The number of species lost to extinction is just overwhelming if you study this at all. I mean, we know the insects are declining. We know the birds are declining. We can easily see those on our windshield and our feeders and in the, in the skies. But these are the natural systems we depend on. By protecting some of this land here locally, the creatures we share this planet with is our part of trying to deal with this problem that we have of habitat loss. And then the third reason, which is probably the most compelling, is that we love living here in this community and we love the Susquehanna River. And we believe we should be able to control our own destiny with good planning. We should be able to set some places aside that they don't become shopping centers or fast food joints or housing developments. And that we can protect what we love, these wooded hills along our river. And by doing so, we can attract top talent to come to the companies here. And this conservation landscape that we are focused on creating along the Susquehanna River can be appreciated by generations to come as the population continues to grow. So our vision is this wooded buffers along our streams, it's the hills, and without our organization, we know that population growth within the next 40 years will overwhelm this, this, this area. So in order to do our work, we need community support, and that's what tonight is all about. Bringing you a lecture like this online before is, is, is just so important. We want to engage with all of you. We want to convince you that protecting this planet by saving land and providing habitat in your backyard is absolutely essential. So now before I turn it back to Fritz, I want to tell my own personal story about Doug Tallamy. His book, Nature's Best Hope, literally changed my life. I was listening to NPR this week and they were talking, people were on talking about books who really reshaped how they view the world. Doug Tallamy is one of those people who did it for me four years ago when I started working at the Conservancy. He helped me to this deep understanding about seeing the world differently, how I treat my yard. I mean, I know I see less insects on my windshield than I did as a child, but I never really understood that all those years in my 30s and my 40s that I spent mowing my lawns and doing my own personal landscaping with flowers for their beauty rather than for their ecological function was actually causing that insect decline. And I think about all those wasted years, I could have been making a huge difference in helping our natural world. And some books just do this, and Doug's did that for me. And when I heard his lecture at Franklin and Marshall a few years ago, I just became a huge fan. So I know, I know that you're gonna enjoy him tonight and I hope you get his book and I hope that you have the same experience with a life-changing event tonight that I did when I read his book four years ago and saw him speak two years ago. So with that said, enjoy tonight. Thanks again for attending and Fritz, I'm turning it back to you. Thanks, Phil. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. And tonight we want to recognize Turkey Hill Dairy, who is our presenting sponsor of Lancaster Water Week, and Clark Associates, who is our lead annual sponsor. Thank you, Turkey Hill Dairy and Clark Associates. Tonight's presentation is co-presented by Willow Valley Communities. Of course, we wished we'd be all together in person uh, and is sponsored in part by Walters Unitarian Church Trust. Thank you both for your support of the Lancaster Conservancy. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 103 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored by Rick Dark, was published in 2014. And Doug's new book, Nature Best Hope, Nature's Best Hope, was released this past February 
and is on the New York Times bestseller list. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Fritz. Do a little screen sharing here. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about uh, what I call making insects, a guide to restoring the little things that run the world. But this phrase here, the little things that run the world, is not mine. That comes from a very famous biologist, uh, E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson. He is, uh, of course, a Harvard professor, Harvard emeritus at this point. Um, certainly the most famous entomologist alive today, one of the most famous biologists. He's had an incredible impact on, on the science. He's 92 this year. He still writes a book a year. I've been lucky enough to meet him twice in, in my career. The first time was way back 1981. There was a, a small conference on social insects. Of course, uh, EO sp uh, studies ants. And he was at this conference in Boulder, Colorado. And it was small enough that, that uh, people gave talks, but there was no place to mill around during break. So everybody would go outside. And I went outside and here's, here's EO sitting on the, on the curb and nobody was sitting next to him. I'm actually a, a pretty shy guy, but I got up my nerve that day. I went over and I sat down next to the great Ed Wilson. He turned and looked at me and he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met and we shook hands. And we talked for a few minutes and it was an exciting time for me. Well, then break was over and there were more talks and then lunch and then more talks and then another break. And I went outside and here's Zio sitting on the curb and nobody's next to him. So I sat down, we were, we were buddies now. I sat down next to him and he turned and looked at me and he said, hi, I'm Ed Wilson. I don't believe we met. That was my first first uh, meeting with with Ia. The second time was uh, 32 years later. He was getting the Ben Franklin Award, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. I met I met Ben too, but I was more excited to see see my buddy Ed Wilson. Um, he was getting this award because of a lifetime contribution to science, but really a lifetime's work trying to save life on Earth. He loves biodiversity and he's written endlessly about what we need to do to turn things around. Uh, and one of the first things he wrote regarding that was this paper called The Little Things That Run the World. This was 1987. It was published in the first issue of Conservation Biology, a new discipline. You know, conservation biology really didn't start till 1987. And in this paper, he made some, some uh, very strong statements, and one is that life as we know it depends on insects. Uh, and most people don't think about that. Uh, and then he told us what would happen if insects actually disappeared. Uh, and the first thing that would happen is most of the flowering plants would also disappear. They would go extinct because of the loss of, of insect pollinators. That would not only change the physical structure of, of terrestrial earth, but it would, it would essentially end most of the energy flow uh, that supports the food webs that support our animals, that they would collapse. So our amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals, and, and even to a great extent, our freshwater fish would disappear as well. The biosphere, the uh, living portion of the earth would rot because we'd lose insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and we'd only have bacteria and fungi left. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. So it was a pretty somber message, but uh, you know it was 1987. Nobody was really worried about losing insects, um, so it was it was ignored. We could not imagine that that these things would actually disappear. And besides, if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now this was 1929, but um, it really reflects what most people think today. This was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects, not just the annoying insects, but all insects out of there. Even if we did succeed in killing all the insects uh, in, in uh, agriculture, which we understand, or all the insects at home, we don't worry about losing them because we think they're still common in our natural areas. Well, there's two reasons why that's no longer the case. And the first is we don't have enough natural areas. I mean, this is what Philip was talking about. Um, this is what the night, light, night uh, map of the US looks like. We're pretty much everywhere. We have, we have turned areas that used to support insects into our, our cities. And of course, they're not designed to support insects or our suburbs, and they're not designed to support insects. Even our rural areas really are not designed to support insects. Then we have agriculture. How about, how about uh, rangeland? 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That is 26 times larger than the state of Pennsylvania, dedicated to cattle. 
not designed to support insects. And when it's overgrazed, as it is in so many places, um, you don't have a lot of insects. As a matter of fact, agriculture uh, on terrestrial Earth now claims half of the Earth's land surface. And of course, those areas are not designed to support insects. The second reason that insects are not doing well in natural areas is that those natural areas, um, almost everywhere, are invaded with plants from someplace else. Where we live, it's primarily from Asia. Um, these are, are uh, there are ornamental plants really that have escaped. Multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and calorie pear and privet and miscanthus and barberry and burning bush and on and on and on. This is White Clay Creek State Park near the University of Delaware. And I took this picture in the spring when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see here is a non-native plant. Uh, it's about a third of the vegetation in most of our, our parks. And those plants are very poor at supporting insects. We'll talk about why in a few minutes. So invasive plants, these non-native plants do destroy insect populations. And we've got more than 3,300 species of introduced plants in this country. Uh, so Phil re, uh, re referred to this, when we were young, these were common sites. We'd drive along and, and they'd be splattered with insects or when you had a night light, all the insects were flying around it. Um, look at your lights these days. You don't see much, you don't see much. So we're winning our war against insects, even if it's uh, an undeclared war. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect declines. Data is starting to come in from around the world and, and none of it looks really, really good. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, data from uh, pollinators because we're concerned about loss of pollinators. Um, and again, it doesn't look good. About 50% of our Midwest native bees have disappeared from their historic ranges in the last uh, century. We got four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% just in the last 26, 20 years. Uh, so they're not gone, but 96%, they're, they're, um, they are functionally extinct because they're not enough of them to perform the roles they used to perform in our ecosystems. There are three species of bumblebees that, that really are extinct and 25% are, are threatened with extinction. Bad news from Europe as well, 30% are, are, are uh, uh, or Europe's uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers and katydids and, and crickets are facing extinction. Um, Britain's uh, moth and butterfly populations are in steep decline. This particular species has declined 90, 96%. Others have actually gone extinct. A lot of data coming out of, of Germany, they've lost 79% of their, their flying insects since 1989 with 46 species of moths and butterflies already gone from Germany. This is the big one. Invertebrate abundance has declined 45% on planet Earth since 1974. So remember, those are the things that, that uh, keep us alive and they've declined 45%, should be, should be alarming. And as insects decline, so do the birds that need them. We've got 432 species of North American birds now threatened with extinction. Not because, not because there's only four left of each one, but because their, their population trajectories are, are um, declining so rapidly. That's the sign of, of impending extinction. You hear all the time, we have to slow the rate of decline. No, we have to stop the rate of decline and have them increase again. We've got 3 billion fewer breeding birds uh, today than we had just, just 40 years ago. Um, new study by Rosenberger et, et, et al. came out last year. We looked at their data and the loss of birds is not, um, it's not consistent across species. As a matter of fact, the, the species of birds that do not require insects during their, their life history actually gained a few million uh, individuals per species. But the species that do depend on insects at, at one part of their life history uh, lost about uh, 10 million individuals per species um, ac across the, the US. So, so the losses are being suffered by the birds that require insects. Uh, more, more bad news from the UN. The UN uh, uh, predicts we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. You know, and they report this without much fanfare. This is not an option, folks. Losing a million species is not an option. It's like saying, well, we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then just go on with the next report. Not going not, not gonna to happen. We can't let it happen. So does it matter? Of course it matters. The creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. Um, it is really hard to, to get humans 
to react to something they consider to be a long-term risk. I mean, look at the challenges we've had trying to get people excited about climate change. Um, unless something's going to hurt us tomorrow, we really don't uh, react to it. Actually, it's got to hurt us in the next five minutes or we don't react to it. So let's, I want you to stop thinking like a human and I want you to think about um, other animals. We're pretty good at feeling protective of other animals. So I want you to pretend that you are this bird. You are a magnolia warbler and you have just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of, of Costa Rica and it is time for you to fly north so that you can breed which means you're going to migrate. And migration is the most dangerous thing you're ever going to do. Predation risks are high. Uh, physiological costs are extremely high. You're going to lose 35% of your body weight when you fly across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, somebody uh, last year or two years ago was looking in the stomach contents of tiger sharks that they caught in the Gulf. And in the springtime, they're filled with migrating birds, the birds that don't make it and crash into the Gulf. So very, uh, it's a very tough thing. And once you, once you reach land in the north. You continue to fly north. Most of these warblers breed uh, up in Pennsylvania or north. Uh, and so they, they fly all night and then they stop and they rest. And during those flights, they again lose 35 to 50 percent of their body weight. So they have to stop and fuel up on insects at each rest stop. You might ask the question, if migration is so hard, why, why did it evolve? And when did the birds just stay in the tropics? Well, migration evolved for the same reason anything evolved. The benefits of migrating outweighed the costs. The costs were large, but the benefits were even greater. What are the benefits of migrating? Migrants have more food to use for reproduction. In the temperate zone, in the spring, of course, we have the production of this giant flush of new leaves across the continent. And that is followed by a giant flush of the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And that is the fuel that birds use when they're reproducing. That doesn't happen in the tropics. Things are much more constant in the tropics. Tremendous amount of competition. There's always, uh, it's tough to get enough food to reproduce. Um, so if you, if you take advantage of this spring bonanza um, by flying north and, and getting all those insects, you can, you can rear three to six offspring per year. If you don't do that, you only rear two to four offspring per year. And that doesn't, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's enough to um, create a, a reproductive advantage that balances those high costs of migration. That's why birds go to all that trouble. So let me, let me uh, emphasize here, bird migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects that were seasonally available in the temperate zone that allowed them to balance the costs of, of migration. How important are insects to birds? This study came out uh, two years ago. Birds eat, I have no idea how they measured this, but they, the estimate was they eat 500 million tons of insects each year. And it was presented as, uh, again, bird, the insects are all bad and the birds are doing us a great favor by eating all these insects. Let's rewrite that statistic and say that birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if they don't get it, we're gonna have fewer birds. So when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone. Is that still the case? Are there still enough insects up here to justify all of those costs associated with, with migration? And the answer is every time somebody measures it, no. Let's just focus on the impact of introduced plants on, on insects. Uh, that's, that's where I have focused uh, most of my research over the last 15 years or so. This is a study that came out recently. Uh, it was just a very simple study did with a, uh, an undergrad where we went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and, and Delaware, and we measured caterpillars along a transect in these hedgerows, hedgerows that were invaded with non-native plants. So here's autumn olive and, and multiflora rose and porcelain berry and all the things that are out there, and compared the caterpillars to hedgerows that were not invaded and were most almost entirely native plants. And what we found was that there was a reduction of, of the number of species by 68% in those invaded hedgerows. The abundance of caterpillars was reduced by 91% and the biomass, the actual energy uh, value of those hedgerows was reduced by 96%. The amount of bird food available was reduced by 96% in those invaded hedgerows. So this loss of, of uh, insects isn't just affecting a few obscure bird species, um, it impacts what, more than half of all the breeding birds in, in North America, about 386 species of our birds are what we call neotropical migrants. 
and they may no longer have enough insects to justify their migration. We're talking about our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers, our buntings and flycatchers, our thrushes, our all those species of warblers. And, and don't forget the resident birds, things like our chickadees and blue jays and all those guys that are staying here. They need thousands and thousands of insects to make one clutch, six to 9,000 caterpillars to, to make one clutch of, of chickadees that uh, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest and then they continue to eat caterpillars after they, they leave. Um, so our birds need lots and lots of insects. This is emphasized by a study that uh, my, my PhD student recent, uh, she's graduated at this point, Desiree Naranjo did on chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. She looked at um, the ability of chickadee populations to sustain themselves in residential neighborhoods based on the types of plants that were in those neighborhoods. Uh, so she studied lots of breeding pairs of chickadees for uh, three years. And this is what a, a typical pair, uh, the, the uh, foraging territory of a typical pair looked like. Here's where the nest was right here. And they forage on average about 50 meters from the nest. The blue areas are the uh, plants on which they did 95% uh, of their foraging. So let's look at what they were. They're all the native trees in this landscape. So basswood and sweet gum and American elm, black cherry, two species of oaks. Let's also look at the trees they did not forage on. And those are all the trees from someplace else, mostly Asia, Japanese maples and silk trees, ginkgo, black poplar, everybody loves their crepe myrtles and saucer magnolias. Uh, they didn't forage there because there are no insects on those trees. It's, it's pretty simple. So she was able to compare population uh, growth rates in landscapes that were largely native versus landscapes that were uh, dominated by introduced plants. And when they were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, they had 75% less bird food for those chickadees. Um, those those uh, landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though uh, Des had a, um, a nest box up in all of these places, the birds came and they looked around and they were smart enough to know there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to breed here. If they did try, those nests contain 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. They produce one, if they did survive, they produce 1.2 fewer fledglings and delayed maturation by um, more, than, more than a day. And you might say, well, it doesn't look like a, a huge differences. But when you put all that together in a population growth model as a function of the, the percentage of non-native plant biomass in the landscape from no non-native plants to 100% non-native plants, this is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you breed at this rate, uh, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you breed, uh, uh, make more babies than adults are dying, then you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you have a shrinking unsustainable population. These lines overlap right here around 30% non-native plant biomass. Uh, so this, this um, this is a very exciting study to me for two reasons. First of all, this is the, the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. It shows a very clear relationship between our plant choices, the, ch the choices of plants we put in our yards and the ability of bird populations to sustain themselves in those, those yards. If we have at least 70% of our plant biomass, productive native plants, the birds can do it. Uh, but it also suggests there's an area for compromise. You can have your, your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, as long as it's not an invasive uh, non-native plant, you can have it there if it's less than 30% of the, of the plant biomass. And to me, that's, that's good news. It suggests we can compromise here. If my message was, you can't have any non-native plants because they're not supporting the insects that, that these birds need. I'd have very few people uh, listening to me. We, we certainly love our, our beautiful non-natives. She also looked at the um, migrants that stopped in, uh, in the properties that she was working on. 51 species of, of migrants stopped by. Uh, and people say, well, they're resting. What they're really doing is refueling so they could continue their, their migration in the spring. Uh, and if they come down in the land of ginkgo here, ginkgo supports zero caterpillars. Uh, that could very well be the end of their, their migration because if you don't get uh, the food you need to continue it, you're, you're done. Um, so a lot of people say, well, I don't own a property big enough to support 
uh, breeding birds. And that might be, be true, but if you own a property big enough to support one tree and you make it the right tree, um, you can you can support uh, migrating birds and they will use uh, those native trees, I guarantee it. What if I said to you that introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%? Remember, they're reducing the insects by 96%, but what if it's reducing your bank account? You would get it that this is this is not good. We understand that we live by our bank account. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account. And remember, it's our ecological bank account that's keeping us alive. We can't afford to lose them. So this all boils down to, to two choices. We can create landscapes in which nature thrives and they're gonna have a lot of insects in them or it's not thriving. Or we can create landscapes that are ecologically dead. Those are our two choices. If we choose the first option, um, we can be sustained ourselves. If we choose the second, uh, we're not gonna be sustained. And so far, I'm sorry, we've chose the second. So we need to, we need to shape up. As far as I can tell, the only viable option we have is to live sustainably ourselves with the natural world that, that sustains us in harmony. We've got to live in harmony with that, that natural world. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's talk about where we're going to do it first. We cannot ignore privately owned property, whether it's owned by a land conservancy, but you know, most of it is owned by uh, just individuals where we live uh, or, or corporations. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored private property, we'd only be doing conservation on 15% of the land, not nearly enough to succeed because those conserved areas would be um, too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that we need them to sustain. So we need to take properties like this and make them conservation centers. And the only way you can make them conservation centers is to create properties that make insects. Remember, we've got insect declines going on right now. What are the causes of those declines? Um, it's been described as death by a thousand cuts. There are a lot of things that are hammering our, our insects. The misuse and overuse of pesticides for sure. Habitat loss, um, we say that for everything, but what that means is we've taken out the plants that support insects uh, and either not put any back or put in non-native plants that don't support insects. That's what habitat loss is, is all about. Uh, and many of those uh, ornamentals become invasive species. They don't stay on our property, they invade our natural areas. We're talking about 85% of the woody invasive plants in North America are escaped ornamentals from our, our garden. And we're still selling them in our, our nurseries. Light pollution is a huge, uh, it has a huge impact on, on insects. We'll talk about that in a bit. And of course, climate change. There's, there's good news here. And that is uh, these five causes are relatively easy to address. Individuals can address these five causes. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's tough for an individual to change uh, his or her behavior and actually impact climate change. The way you're going to impact climate change is in the, in the voting booth. But you can change your behavior and see measurable results uh, in terms of insect populations by, by addressing these. So again, we'll talk about that. What we need to do is raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. This is a, this is a house down the street from me. And believe me, this guy is proud of, of, of his lawn. Um, but um, it's a dead zone and it's wrecking my, my watershed. So what we need to do is, is start thinking about what plants do um, from an ecological perspective, instead of just considering them to be decorations. That's what we've thought about for the last couple hundred years. You go to the, to the nursery and you buy something that's pretty. Maybe it can be a screen or an anchor or a focal point, but all of the focus has been on aesthetics, not thinking about the ecological role those plants need to play. And when we landscape, um, using choosing our plants uh, only as if they're decorations, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. That's, that's pretty, but it's not a functional ecosystem. We can find pretty plants that produce ecosystem services, that support food webs, that protect our watershed, store carbon, restore soil, create a pollinator habitat, natural enemy habitat. All of these things can uh, come from proper plant selection. And when we choose plants based on uh, function, at least part of the criteria is function, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I'm going to call this 21st century landscaping. Um, this is the future. 
folks. We've done 20th century landscaping and we're now in the sixth great ex extinction. It's not working. So we need to, to rethink it and put those powerhouse plants back into our landscape. All right. All of that, believe it or not, was introduction. Um, we can't restore ecosystems and their function without restoring insect populations. So let's talk about how to do that. What does it take to make an insect? It takes the same thing it takes to make any life form, and that is energy from the sun. If you're looking for a, a miracle on, on planet Earth, look to photosynthesis. Plants allow us, permit us, enable us to eat sunlight. Uh, and without photosynthesis, we're going to have to eat sunlight uh, some other way, and that's, that's not going to happen. What they do is they take CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the air, combine it with water from the, the ground, produce oxygen that we all still need, and now the energy from the sun is tied up in the, the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates. Uh, and that is the food. That is the food that drives everything on, on planet Earth, with some minor exceptions of sulfur-based food webs at the bottom of the ocean. They're not going to solve our problems. So let's just say plants are making all the food. To make insects, we first need plants. Okay. Now we have to decide which insects we're going to make. There are a lot of insects out there, three to four million species estimated worldwide. It's an estimate because we still haven't even described all of them. We've only described a little bit more than one million species. Um, they're going extinct much faster than we are describing them. We've got about 164,000 species in the U.S. and you're not going to have them all in your yard. So which ones are we going to focus on? Well, uh, some groups are simply more important. They have a bigger impact on ecosystem function than other groups. So let's focus on the two most important groups uh, of insects. And that would be the insects that maintain plant diversity and then the insects that, that contribute the energy that plants harness from the sun to food webs, the insert insects that are transferring that energy from plants to other animals. So we're talking about pollinators and we're talking about caterpillars, believe it or not. Who says the uh, two most important uh, groups of, of insects? I do and I'm giving this talk, so I get to say that. Somebody somewhere will disagree with me, but believe me, they're, they're important. So let's start with pollinators. Some basic questions, why do we need pollinators? Uh, if you listen to the news, it will say we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our, our crops. Um, that's actually, that's been, been looked at against really about one seventh of our crops, but that's a very anthropocentric you know, view of why we need pollinators. In fact, insects are pollinating, or pollinators, which is mostly insects, are pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we were to lose pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is simply not an option. It goes way beyond having fruits and vegetables in, in the store. Where do we need those pollinators? Everywhere, everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. So we're really, we're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. Well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna make pollinators, we have to know what a pollinator is. Most insects, believe it or not, that go to flowers do not pollinate them. So we call them flower visitors. So uh, a lot of people see a lot of activity around their, their flowers and they're very, very happy. But um, many of those are not actually transferring pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. That's what a pollinator does. Who are, are the major pollinators and ones that actually are transferring a lot of pollen? Well, we have one species of introduced honeybee. It's an excellent pollinator, particularly of the introduced crops that we brought to this, this country. We have 4,000 species of native bees, um, many, many of which, um, at least 1,500 of which are highly specialized on particular plants. And then we have 14,000 species of moths and butterflies. Um, so in general, moths and butterflies are, are not good transfers of pollen. They're not great pollinators. Some are specialists though, and many of them are doing this pollination at night when we're not looking. Uh, so because of the sheer number, uh, there's a great deal of pollination that is occurring with moth activity. Okay, so what is a bee? You know, if I, if I suggest to people, I want you to, to save uh, native bees. I want you to create habitat in your yard. Um, I have heard many times, nope, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get stung. I say, well, the native bees are not going to sting you. Um, most of them are solitary. They don't, they're not protecting a hive. You can pet them while they're foraging. They're not going to sting you. And I hear, no, no, they do sting me. I got stung last week. And what really is happening is you got stung by a yellow jacket. 
Bees get blamed for yellow jacket stings all the, all the time. Uh, yellow jackets aren't bees at all. They're wasps. They're aggressive wasps. They're social wasps. They protect their hive. And this time of year, they've got big, big colonies. And they do. They nail you in the back of the head. That's not what I'm suggesting you have at, at your house. I want you to have these, these native bees that uh, really are, are docile little creatures, but essential. Um, so what, what we need to do if we're going to have them at home is to give them a place to eat or a place to live and something to eat. So where do they nest? They nest in the ground, they nest in woody stems, and they nest, nest <coughs> in pithy stems. But most of them are ground nesters. About 70% of our bees um, will tunnel into the ground. They, they drop a, a shaft straight down and then have lateral shafts going off to the side. You've got a single female here who uh, is, is bringing in pollen to feed her, her young. Um, and then she seals this up and, and goes and does it again. This is a Kalides bee. It's, they're very shy. If a shadow hits them, they, they jump back in. So people see them flying around their yard and they get all excited. Oh, they're going to they're gonna come sting me. They're not going to come sting you. <clears throat> Pithy and woody stem nesters do this. this. They make cells um, and progressive cells. So this one's older than this one. And, and I'll come back here. Uh, and they pack them full of pollen and lay an egg on it. So this is what a bee larva looks like. It's eating the pollen. Um, this one's a little younger, that one's younger yet. And when they're complete, uh, complete their development, they'll pupate here and then they tunnel out through the side. This is a great slide by Heather Holm showing you exactly what's happening in those woody or pithy stems. What's a woody stem or a pithy stem? Um, you, you know, those old field uh, stems at the end of the season that all look like they're dead, that's where the bees are, are nesting, inside those, those stems. Um, so when we mow down our, our fields every single year, we're mowing down habitat that is vital to a lot of our, our uh, overwintering bees. This is what a woody stem looks like. They always go into um, soft wood, things like elderberry. Uh, elderberry has a lot of dead twigs on it if you don't touch it. And what do we do? We prune them out because we don't want it to be uh, messy. But again, vital habitat to our, our native bees. Um, so typically in, in suburbia, we don't have a lot of woody material for bees to nest in. But we have invented what we call bee hotels. Uh, and people love bee hotels. They love them so much that they make giant bee hotels. It's a lot of fun. And be, the bees do use them. Uh, but there is a, there is a problem. Research is showing that when you make big bee hotels and you focus all the nesting uh, sites in one place on your property, that's putting all your bees in one basket. And if a disease or a predator finds the, that basket, then they, they really have a big impact. So the suggestion now is to make much smaller bee hotels and scatter them throughout your property. Um, so you don't put all your bees in, in one basket. If a predator finds them, it's not gonna wipe them all out. Certainly makes sense. What do bees need to reproduce? They need pollen and they need nectar and they need it all season long. Here's data from um, uh, Jared Fowler looking at the distribution of native bees in New England. And they're around from March all the way to November. Uh, and of course, when they're around, they need something to eat. That something is, is, uh, is forage, it's blooming plants. And this is the biggest challenge in terms of having health or po healthy pollinator habitat, is having something blooming that the bees will use all season long. What species of plants do we need to plant for native bees? Uh, this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you in all of our bee discussion here, and it comes from Sam Drogi. He's Mr. Native Bee. He says, we need to choose plants that satisfy the needs of our specialist bees. Um, the bees that require the pollen from one particular genus of plants. If we plant for the specialist, the generalist bees, the ones that can use lots of different plants, we use those plants as well. But if we only plant for the generalist, and every time you put a, a non-native plant that our, our specialist could not have specialized on, so things like butterfly bush, um, the generalist will go there, but our specialist will be excluded. Why are bees specializing? Because flowers differ in all kinds of things. They differ in what they look like, what they smell like, when they, they uh, bloom, their pollen morphology is specific for the, the specialized bee that uh, is, is transferring that pollen. These little little nooks and crannies match up with the, the bee hairs. They have different nutritional uh, values. So bees specialize on all of these things so they get really good at transferring the pollen. And that's what the plant wants. The plant doesn't want things that aren't gonna transfer the pollen to eat that pollen. So here's a list of, of specialist bees for, for Pennsylvania. 
just a partial list really um, sunflowers uh, are, are uh, particularly our, our perennial sunflowers really good at supporting special species about 13 bee species are asters um, again really good about 12 more species goldenrod 11 species willows nine species you know just with these four genera of, of um, plants uh, you can have uh, what 45 46 species of of bees in your yard. If you don't have these genera plants, you've got you won't have those 46 species. And then it goes right down the list. There's a lot of plants that only support one or two bee species. So the more diversity of native plants we have, the more bee species you're going to support. Okay, that's all we're going to say about about um, bees. Let's talk about those caterpillars that are so important to to uh, maintaining the food webs that support other animals. Why? Because it turns out that caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other insect. In other words, a lot of animals eat caterpillars, but they don't eat plants. It's the caterpillar that's getting the energy from the plant and then something eats the caterpillar. So they are enormously important, which means we've got to increase the number of caterpillars in our yard if we want to transfer that, that energy. How do we do that? Well, you add caterpillars to your landscapes by adding the plants that make caterpillars. Makes sense, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So you gotta add the ones that do, or the whole system's not gonna work. Um, why is that? Because, because plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their, their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make them either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that, that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well protected chemically. And if you don't believe me after this talk, go out and, and eat a plant and see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. All the plants protect themselves uh, chemically. Um, there's a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they are toxic. Yes, that's a joke. Um, but you know, we do know that insects eat, eat plants. How do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They develop a very tight relationship with a specific lineage of plants and they get good at getting around the defenses of that lineage. They can't do it for any other lineage, just the ones they specialize on over evolutionary time um, where they develop the enzymes that store and excrete and, and, and uh, detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize uh, their exposure to those compounds, that allows them to eat those plants without dying. But to get all those adaptations takes again, a long period of exposure to those plants. It does not happen overnight. And that's why when we, we put crepe myrtle in our yard, nothing can eat it. It hasn't been here long enough for all the adaptation to, to happen. And, and how long is long enough? Thousands of years, believe it or not. That's another talk. I can support that if you don't believe me. English ivy doesn't support anything. Um, you know, our burning bush, all the things that we plant out there support very, very few caterpillars. Point is, plant choice matters if we're trying to restore insect populations. If I want to have the Pandora Sphinx at my house, and when we moved in, I did want to have it because I like to take pictures of these things. I got to put in Virginia creeper. That's what they eat. If I want the tulip tree silk moth, I need tulip tree. If I want the luna moth, at least where we lived, I need sweet gum. We wanted the zebra swallowtail, put in pawpaw. It took nine years. They're specialists on pawpaw, but finally after nine years, um, we got the zebra swallowtails. Uh, so this is how it works. Um, eight spotted farser moth on grape, uh, native grapes support a lot of different things. These are just examples of what comes to these plants. Green marvel on viburnum, brown hooded owlet on, on goldenrod. Goldenrod supports 110 species of caterpillars in this, this part of the world. Even poison ivy supports uh, 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 important moths, things like the beautiful utilia. And I know what you're saying. Oh, I can't have poison, around, poison ivy around or, or I'll get it. You know when you get poison ivy? When you try to get rid of it. Ignore it. It, it won't chase you. And it produces really valuable berries that our, our birds use in the fall. Uh, persimmon, the sculpture moth on persimmon, the Hebrew on black gum, uh, our beleaguered ashes produce a lot of important sphinx moths like the beautiful fawn sphinx. I think that's, that's art in the garden right there, just gorgeous. 
maple is really important. Rosy maple moth on, on maples. This is my favorite large uh, moth, the royal walnut moth. It's on walnut and hickory. Uh, this is already extirpated from New England, by the way, um, just to show you things really are, are declining. Elm is really important, double tooth prominent on, on elm. Witch hazel, not that important, but it supports the witch hazel dagger moth and a few other things. Pines are, are great, imperial moth on pines. Our native clematis, native clematis, not the, the invasive uh, escapee from our garden, support the spotted thyrus, two-toned ancillus on ironwood, lost owlet on buttonbush, the herald on native willow, snowberry clear wing on coral honeysuckle, that's the native honeysuckle. The evening primrose moth, believe it or not, is on evening primrose, and this is, is what it does during the day. It hides in, in those flowers. Always fun to find that. Um, showy sumac, uh, or showy emerald on, on sumac, and I'm not talking about poison sumac. I've never even seen poison sumac. That's a, that's a plant of the swamp. Um, but staghorn sumac or smooth sumac, great soil stabilizers. Um, you don't have to get a plant from China to stabilize your soil. Then we've got a couple of, of uh, plant genera that are really important, like, like native prunus, things like black cherry, uh, making a lot of, of, of species like the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the beautiful cecropia moth, the colorful zale, the tufted bird dropping moth. And I ask you, who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth in their yard? It's fun just saying the name. The paddle caterpillar. Ask your kids what those paddles are for. There's a reason they're not there for, for, for show. They're not there for decoration and, and don't tell them what it is. Let them figure it out. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is either. I want you to figure it out. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these expandable uh, filaments on its, on its back. Small light sphinx, these things are still all on black cherry. The Harris is three spot, uh, makes an umbrella out of the um, shed uh, cuticles or, or head capsules of uh, every time it sheds and then holds it over its head. Everybody wondered why it did that until they saw it, uh, it actually uses it as a, as a weapon. If something comes in to eat it, it swings back and forth and whacks them with his little umbrella there. Then oaks, the most powerful plant you can put in your yard, certainly in Pennsylvania, actually in 84% of the counties of North America, will give you the, the hag moth that thinks it's a tarantula, the red wash prominent, the white dotted prominent spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, the solitary oak leaf miner, crown bucolatrix, half oval ancillus, the pink striped oak worm, and my favorite by far, the spun glass slug caterpillar. They're called slugs because their head is hidden underneath, but they're not slugs, they're caterpillars, they're not hairy. I mean, that is, you can't get more delicate than that. Plus, literally hundreds more species on our oaks. As a matter of fact, oaks are the best example uh, we have of a new, new phenomenon we've discovered in, in our lab, and that is what we're calling keystone species, keystone plants. It turns out there are huge differences among our native plants, forget the non-natives, but among our native plants, huge differences among the species in their ability to support food webs by making caterpillars. About 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives the food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the, the caterpillar food, which means there's a whole lot of native plants not, not making a lot. Um, so in the mid-Atlantic states, the uh, oaks support 557 caterpillar species. Nationwide, they support 900 caterpillar species, really important plants. Where did I take all those pictures of, of uh, the caterpillars I just showed you? I took them in my yard and that's what my yard looked like when we moved in. Um, it was mowed for hay, part of a farm that was, was broken up uh, and uh, not much there. Well, we put the plants back or we're still putting plants back. Um, we've got a little, little lawn there, very traditional here. Uh, but because we put the plants back, so many species of moths, I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, but so many species of moths started coming to our yard, feeding our birds, that I made it a goal to take pictures of every one I could find. I'm up to 1,012 species of moths that I recorded at our house. That's 1,012 1, species of, of bird food right there. Why do we have that? Because we planted all of these things and, and actually much more, witch hazel and oaks and persimmon, American elm, red maples, all these guys. Remember it was mowed for hay, not much there. Uh, but we tolerated things that people considered weeds. Black cherry, you know, oh, it's a weedy tree. Well, it's a great tree. Our ferns, our grapes, tulip trees, Virginia creeper, nobody likes it, but it's, it's great. Goldenrod, 
Um, even poison ivy, greenbrier, dotter. These are plants that most people yank out, but each plant lineage is supporting um, caterpillars that then support the foods. That's how you, you or the birds, that's how you rebuild food webs is with a diversity of plants. And every time we add caterpillars to our yard, we're adding the birds that, that um, eat them. Like wood thrush, we added this last year. Uh, wood thrush, of course, is a, a forest bird. Uh, and our forest at this point is only 20 years old, so it's not, not huge. But what wood thrush really want is something to eat. They love to forage in leaf litter, so you got to have leaf litter from trees. Uh, and we've got them now because we've got Virginia creeper making lettered sphinx. That's what it's feeding to its young right there. We've got indigo bunnies because we have alders um, making ruby quakers. We have chipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edged bomalocas. We have field sparrows because we have those oaks making red line panapoters and many other things. Tufted tip mice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions. That really is the name of all of these different caterpillars. Phoebe's nesting on our, our light fixture over our front porch because we've got a lot of native grasses making the skippers that they love. Robins, <laughs> which are cleaning up on, on white line sphinx and many other things that are breeding on the, the weeds that are in our our, uh, our yard. Then we've got those Carolina chickadees. Because we've got tulip trees making tulip tree beauties. White eyed virias because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtails. House wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings. And bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. We have 55 species of birds that have bred on our property because we've got so much bird food. Point is, it works. It works. By choosing the right plants and by using more of them, we could make insects nearly everywhere. And I wanna leave you with nine things that you can do to restore ecosystem function in your yard by rebuilding the insect populations in your yard. And the first one is we have to deal with the lawn. We have uh, more than 40 million acres of lawn in the US. That figure is actually about 15 years old now. Who knows what it, what it really is, but it's millions and it's greater than the size of New England. Looks like this, that's a dead zone folks. We add lawn because it's a status symbol. We want to tell everybody how, how neat we are and how much money we have. And I understand that. We're, you know, humans are not going to give up status symbols. But um, let's still maintain our lawn in a high status way, but let's cut it in half. Let's reduce the area of lawn by, by 50%. We could have a, a um, that's 20 million acres that we could, we could deal with. Uh, restore put the plants back, um, we can create a new national park. And again, if we do it at home, we could call it homegrown national park. I drove by this, uh, this church in Mississippi uh, not long ago, well, before the virus. Uh, so everybody's inside uh, worshiping God's creations and on the outside, they're, they're killing them with, with giant, giant lawn. We're not thinking about what we're doing to the, to the land. So we're gonna cut our lawn in half um, we're going to plant for specialist bees. We've already talked about that. We're going to move, remove invasive species from our property. Uh, remember, most of the big invasives that we have are ornamentals that have escaped. So if we still have them on our property, they're still sending propagules out into our natural areas. And if 85% of the land is privately owned and everybody removed their invasive species from their private property, we'd be 85% done. Um, so it was, ah, it's impossible. Just worry about your own property. It's not impossible, you can do it. We're gonna use those keystone plants that we talked about. Where do you find out what the keystone plants are? You go to Native Plant Finder, National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of woody and herbaceous plants, the best ones for making caterpillars in your, uh, your county will pop up. If I've given you an example here, I ended because I ran out of room, but you get the entire list. Um, and oaks, in, and particularly in this part of the world, are always going to be at the head of the lift list. But notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native birches. You can go to the nursery and buy non-native individuals of all of these. And when you do that, you reduce your caterpillar production by 68%. Why would you buy a non-native oak, an, an English oak or a Chinese oak? We have 90 species of oaks in this country. I mean, I don't know. That makes sense. Herbaceous plants, goldenrod uh, is, is a leader in terms of making caterpillars. Aster's way up there, the sunflowers. And remember, those three are really good at the specialized bees as well. Then things you don't think of, the, anything in the, the solanum or uh, native strawberries, smart weeds. 
um, are all producing caterpillars. So people used to say, I don't know what to plant in order to, to uh, enhance life on my property. Now you do know to plant that. That uh, excuse is gone. We have good information on that. We have to landscape so the caterpillars can complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and in Chester County, oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them complete their development on the tree, like the polyphemus moth. It eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon and hangs from the twigs, and then it emerges as an adult and does it all over again. Everything happens on, on the tree. Uh, and that's great. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them, 480 of them, drop from the tree and wiggle themselves under the, under the ground. Uh, they can do that when the ground is, is typically soft. And then they pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree and spend the winter that way. The problem, of course, is that we don't have leaf litter under our, our trees. Uh, and we mow everything and compact it so that it's too, too uh, hard for uh, caterpillars to, to uh, get underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. The adult moths come in, lay their eggs there, the caterpillars develop, drop down, and die. And it doesn't take too many generations before you've wiped out your local moth population because of what we do under our trees. And the cement uh, option for, for landscaping is even less uh, attractive to moths. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. Um, we certainly need trees in our cities. I am trying to discourage the, the um, use of profligate use of, of cement, which is just laziness. This is the default landscape in so many cities and it ruins our watersheds and it's unnecessary. This is what most people do. They, they have a big lawn, have a, a tree in the middle of that lawn and nobody studied the survivorship of caterpillars in a situation like this, but I guarantee that it's higher in a situation like this, where you have a tree, a layered landscape with, um, uh, this is a native azalea, but you could have a dogwood over that and then the azalea, then ferns and ground cover. Caterpillars drop down into a safe zone. They can easily get underground and pupate or spin their cocoon. They're not going to get mowed. They're not going to get trampled. This is where you can do your, your creative uh, spring ephemeral gardening. Again, safe site for the caterpillars or put in your, your uh, ground covers, things like wild ginger or may apple or foam flower, lots of choices there. And the caterpillars can complete their development. Reduce your light pollution. If we put in keystone plants, they bring the, the, the uh, moths in, but then we kill them in our lights. It's turning out that, that um, light pollution globally is one of the major causes of, of uh, insect declines. You know, after a hundred years of wondering why insects go to lights, we still don't have a, a good explanation for it, but they do. And they get killed most of the time. They die from exhaustion. They're flying around until they, they run out of steam. They collide with the bulb and get incinerated. They, they die of dehydration. They get picked off by bats or other predators. Um, there are many species that get blinded by the light. Who knew? Um, and then it wrecks their, their daily act activities. Um, so again, light pollution uh, globally is causing insect declines, but it's actually good news because this is a cause that is easily dealt with. All we have to do is turn out our lights, pretty easy. Uh, but I know what you're gonna say. You can't turn out your light because the bad man will come. All right then, put a motion sensor on your security light. So it only goes on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna, you're gonna notice is how often the bad man does not come. If you don't wanna do that, take out the white light on your security light and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects and the least attractive are yellow LED lights. If everybody switched to yellow LED lights, we, overnight we could save billions of insects and we can do this, it's easy. We'd also save a lot of energy by doing that. Opposed mosquito spraying. And this, this is a huge problem these, these days. You know, I'm, I'm talking all over the country telling you make more insects, they run our ecosystems and Mosquito Joe is going and killing them all. Um, and and it, <laughs> if this worked, if it really killed the mosquitoes that we don't like, um, you could say, okay, that's justified, but it doesn't even work. It kills about 10% of the adult mosquitoes. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90%. Um, now he would say, oh, it is, uh, this is organic. It's a natural product and therefore it's safe. Um, it is a natural product. It's, it's pyrethroids, comes from chrysanthemums. And, um, but you know, cyanide is a natural 
natural product too. It does not make it safe. He'll also say, well, this doesn't, this only kills adult mosquitoes. Not so. Kills everything it comes in, in contact with. Uh, so this is a hand sprayer. What about the guys that go down the street and just pump it out from the sides of big big trucks? You get nailed whether you whether you want to or not. The way to control mosquitoes uh, is in a, in a much safer way, with one caveat that I'll talk about, is with mosquito dunks. You get a bucket, you fill it with water, you put in straw or hay, it creates this medium that is irresistible to, to gravid females, to females about to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in the bucket and then you throw in a mosquito dunk. This is Bacillus thuringiensis um, and Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis is specific to dipterans. So it, it is only going to kill the mosquitoes that you're, you're um, trying to kill. Uh, although I got an email the other day and I wish I hadn't gotten it, but I pointed out, well, you know, it also kills midges. It kills chironomids. So if you indiscriminately throw this into marshes and, and the, any aquatic system, you are knocking out not just mosquitoes, but a very important component of that aquatic ecosystem. But in a targeted place like this, your little bucket, that's not where we're creating all of our chironomids. Those are the regular midges. They don't, they don't bite you. Um, so I still am going to recommend this for mosquito control. If everybody had a bucket with mosquito dunks, where do you get these? You get it at your hardware store, by the way. We could really uh, knock down mosquito populations because that's where you do it. You do it in the larval stage, not the adult stage. Minimize insecticide use in general. You know, homeowners use more pesticides uh, per acre than, than is used in agriculture. And most of it, other than termite use, most of it is absolutely unnecessary. Well, it, it's there because of entomophobia. We don't like insects, uh, but we don't have any good reason not, not to like them. Our, our parents told us not to. That's not a good reason. Uh, so please, before you start spraying, con consider the, the impact. And then finally, um, I hear all the time, well, I can't landscape in a way that's going to increase insects because my homeowners association, my, my civic association, doesn't allow me to. They tell me what plants I have to use and then my, my grass has to be really short. And they do have lots of rules. And those rules were established in the 70s to keep you from putting a rusty car in your front, front yard because now you live in a high, high status neighborhood. I understand that. Uh, but nobody was thinking about the ecological impact of our sterile landscaping when we made these rules. So join your HOA and change from within. Don't just complain to them, join your HOA and explain to them um, there's a better way uh, and, and um, it'll happen. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end the way I started and that's with, with uh, E.O. Wilson, Ed, Ed Wilson. As I said, he writes a book a, a year. The one he wrote in 2016 was called Half Earth, uh, Our Planets Fight for Life. What he said in that book, is that in order to save life on planet Earth, sounds like a good goal, we need to preserve ecosystem function on half of the planet. No ifs, ands, and buts. And, and most of the book talks about the science that supports that, that statement. Well, that sounds great, but remember, half of planet Earth is already in agriculture. Uh, so nobody's gonna touch that right away. And who's in the other half? We're all there with all of our infrastructure, our 7.8 billion people, our airports, our golf course, all of, all of the places we live uh, and, and work and play are in that other half. How can we maintain ecosystem function in that other half? So most people uh, just throw up their hands and say it can't be done. I say it can be done. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation. The old approach has been, been uh, humans here, nature someplace else. We have had this idea that we cannot coexist with the natural world. Not so, we can coexist with the natural world. We have to save nature where we are, where humans abound. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the earth has ecological significance, including our yards. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it's a good living. It's a good living, but you can save it. We really have to consider saving it where we, we live. And I like this approach because uh, it empowers each one of us. There are huge environmental issues out there right now. 
climate change, giant fires, all these things happening. And most people feel absolutely powerless. They don't feel like they can do anything. But this, the biodiversity crisis, is something an individual can address. Put in that oak tree in your yard. And the very next day, you can go out and measure the difference uh, and certainly measure big differences within just a short period of time. That empowers you. You're now an important, uh, as an individual, you're an important component of future efforts in, in conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet. That will depress you. Just think about what's happening on your own, your own property. You know, I've got, I've got, uh, what did I say, 1,012 species of moss at, at my house. The other day, the headline was um, the National uh, World Wildlife Fund says we've lost two thirds of, of, um, of the uh, populations of wildlife on planet Earth in the last 50 years. All I can say is not at my house. I think we've, we've increased it by at least two thirds by putting in those plants. You can put it back. So as property owners or as volunteers, even if you don't own a property, you can volunteer in a nearby pro uh, park or preserve. Um, we do have the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Nobody's gonna do it alone, but collectively we can do it. We really are nature's best hope. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, I. I have to say I feel completely jazzed up and really honestly empowered to go pull out the remaining uh, pieces of my lawn, dig it out and, um, you know, start planting more goldenrod and asters, which I know we're all enjoying right now as uh, uh, fall comes on. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can put your questions for Doug to answer in the Q&A box um, that you'll find on your screen. Um, do not put them in the comment section because we'll not be able to um, keep track of them there. Um, and while you start putting your questions for Doug in that Q&A box, I want to remind you um, of some of the upcoming uh, Nature Hour lectures that we have uh, that Fritz mentioned at the beginning of the night. We have Tree Talk, Identifying Trees During Any Season with Ryan Davis from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Saving History Through Land Protection with our very own Kate Gonick. I'm very excited to hear about the history that's being preserved on our own preserves. And of course, Harvest Moon, a night for the Susquehanna River, a night um, that will be sure to be filled with laughter and fun and a lot of meaningful moments. We hope you will join us for this reimagined fall gala on Friday, October 2nd. All right, and let's see what kind of questions we have popping into our Q&A section here. Um, we have a question from John to start the night here. How can we convince landscape centers as well as landscape architects to stop promoting and selling non-native trees and plants? There are so many native plants that are just beautiful, plus the native plants take less care, water, fertilizer, et cetera, to maintain. Well, I've been trying to do that for <laughs> not more than 15 years at this point. Um, you know, you present the logical argument I've never, I've never presented this argument and had somebody say that, that's just wrong and it doesn't make any sense. So um, I do think in this case, education makes a, a difference. And I can, I can see change, particularly in the last 10 years. I've, I've talked to the, um, the national meeting of the ASLA, uh, the you know, national conference, oh, I think three times, and smaller um, um, landscape architect groups. Um, back before the virus, when I was out giving talks, there were always landscape designers in, in the audience. So there are a lot of people that are, are recognizing that there is a market here. Um, native plant sales around the country are through the roof. The big problem now is they don't have enough to satisfy the need. Um, so it's, it's market driven and the market is demonstrating that we need to create a, uh, an entire new niche for landscaping. I'll call it the uh, ecological landscaping or ecological gardening. Most people or a lot of people ask me, who can I hire? And unfortunately, most of the time I say, I don't know who you can hire. So, um, so the, the, the green industry is actually figuring this out. More uh, traditional uh, nurseries are covering a greater or, or uh, carrying a, a greater number of, of uh, native plants. Um, so really, it's market driven, and I see it happening. So, uh, uh, 
spread the word. It'll continue to happen. I do think we're going to get to a, a threshold where people start doing it, even if they don't care about the results, they're going to do it because it's the standard in their, their neighborhood. I know that might sound like a, a pipe dream at this point, but we're getting closer and closer to that. You see this with, with water issues in the West. You know, in the West, the, the, the uh, big lawn was a status symbol, just like it was in or still is in the east, but but then they ran out of water. So the guy with the big lawn is now the the neighborhood pariah. Everybody knows they don't have the water to to sustain that lawn, um, and and they're getting rid of it. There's a, there's even uh, uh, cost share programs to convincing people to transfer their lawn. We actually could turn this around overnight by changing the tax structure. You get taxed by the number of square feet you have of of lawn or or some kind of. Uh, tax break if you have native plantings. If we got serious about it, we could do that right away. So anyway, I'm, a, I'm optimistic. We, we can convince people. That's a fantastic idea. And I feel really encouraged by that. We do have uh, several questions in here about where people can buy some different types of native plants. Um, and I know we personally on our website, uh, lancasterconservancy.org backslash habitat have a local list of places where you can find native plants. And do you have any suggestions being from Pennsylvania yourself? Um, Doug, of where people can go to find native plant sellers? Uh, you know, it really does depend on, on where you where you live. Uh, not too too far from us is Octorero uh, Nursery, yeah. um, that uh, has a, a big big selection. Um, <laughs> that's the one that's popping <laughs> yeah. into my mind right now. But yeah, um, you know, most most. Um, there are an awful lot of conservation groups that have native plant sales every every spring, uh, but again, and and this is where the the web really is a useful source. Mm -hmm. Put in native plants for your county or where you live, and more and more nurseries will will pop up. I know the uh, that native plant finder website uh, for the National Wildlife Federation. They have talked for years about um, posting for every county, all of the, uh, the, the you know, people that are selling native plants. Mm. Um, it's not there yet, but uh, if they get there, that'll be a very, very important resource as well. Definitely. Um, a question from Scott. What is the best way to dispose of those mosquito dunks after using them? Hmm. Now that is a new question. Um, it, you know, it's, it is a disease again, specific to, to dipterans, so if, to aquatic dipterans. So if, if I would take it out and throw it in the garbage can. Um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be active for, forever and you keep it out of uh, an aquatic system and it should be, should be fine. Fantastic. Um, we had another question too um, about how fungi might fit into this whole um, system of habitat that, that is necessary to restore insects on our properties. Well, <laughs> you know, the below ground um, ecosystem houses uh, more individuals and more species than the above ground uh, ecosystem does. Uh, it's just that it's below ground, so we don't pay attention to it. But, <laughs> but uh, and, and fungi and, and uh, mycorrhizal associations with plants are, are critical uh, foundations for uh, particularly for the healthy uh, growth of, of plants and the transfer of, of nutrients. Fungi are essential in breaking down the leaves from the uh, the previous year and returning nutrients to the soil. So I don't talk about that, but that doesn't mean it's not in, important. Um, it's something that's pretty good at establishing itself. Uh, if you plant a, a plant and you you are wondering, should I fertilize it or what should I do? Uh, and it's a native plant, I would get some leaf litter from a place where that plant is already growing and just simply scattered around that plant. What you're doing is inoculating the soil underneath that, that particularly for trees. So if I planted a white oak in my yard and I wanted to inoculate it with, with good white oak my, mycorrhizae and other, other good things, I'd go to a white oak in the woods and, and just, just get the top layer, uh, half inch of soil a little bit. You don't need a lot. You're inoculating it and then it will grow on its own. But you know, even if you don't inoculate, it comes, it comes. I remember many years ago, I was gonna do an experiment with mycorrhizae in a greenhouse. And the big problem I, I had, we actually ended up not doing it, is that I learned that they, the, the spores actually float on the, on the air and the problem is how to keep them out of your, of your pots in the controls where you didn't want any. Um, so, so 
nature's pretty good about restoring itself when we give it half half a chance, but certainly fungus, uh, you know, bacteria, all those soil organisms are extremely important. Anne would uh, love to know, are the lanternflies affecting populations of native insects and birds? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. I would say not yet. Lanternflies, of course, uh, are another introduced insect. When I say we need insects, I am not talking about non-native insects. I'm not talking about gypsy moth or hemlock willy adelgid or hemlock aspor or any of these other things we bring in without any natural controls. Lanternfly is the latest one. They're a sucking insect. It's a homopteran, and they're they're you know huge problem for uh, particularly for the fruit industry, apples and grapes. Um, but they're not at the at the stage where they're where they're wiping out plants. If they were wiping out, for example, the emerald ash borers, wiping out our ashes. That's that's 95 species of insects that suffer when you wipe out your your ashes. Lanternfly is not doing that yet. Lanternfly is interesting because it it is brightly colored, so it that's aposematic coloration. It suggests that it tastes bad, and predators are are good at learning. Um, to avoid brightly colored insects. I say, well, they taste, they taste terrible. Yet I, I have seen birds eat lanternflies at my house three times this year. And I wondered why I looked into it. It turns out that the lanternflies get the nasties that make them taste bad from their favorite host plant, which is Alanthus. So by the way, if you have any Alanthus on your property, there's a great reason to get rid of it because that's what lanternflies love to develop on. It's not the only thing they can develop on, but they love to develop on that and that makes them bad tasting. But if they if they mature on native grapes, for example, they don't taste bad, and the birds are figuring that out. So uh, we've got migrating birds coming through now, and um, I'm I'm watching them to see how much they're taking advantage of of lantern flies. It's always good to add another food source. So I don't think it's hurting the birds at this point. Even more of a reason to cut down Olympus. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A question from Cindy you know, related to cutting things down. She wants to know what is the best time of year to cut back plants, um, you know, in the spring or at some point during the year? Yeah, um, you know, it, you get different uh, opinions on that. Uh, one is anytime your saw is sharp, <laughs> but uh, in, it, it, it's logical. The other one, the standard answer is that you wait until the leaves have fallen from the tree or the, the plant because what happens is the plant reabsorbs the nutrients from the leaves, most of them, before they, they drop them. So if you cut off a, a branch in July, for example, all the, the nutrients that are tied up in those leaves uh, are, are eliminated from the branch at the same time. Um, so uh, fall, after the leaves, you know, the uh, things like oaks hang on to the leaves for a long time, but after they turn all brown and it's obvious that there's no more green, that's probably a good time to, to prune. Um, but then you want to do all your pruning before things start to, to, before the sap flows in the spring. So I would say um, maybe be done by, by the end of February. Mm. And does that hold true for those woody and pithy stems as well? You know, that the native bees are- Okay, all right. Uh, well, of course, those those things are dead. They're just yeah. housing for yes. for the plants. I I simplified that a little bit. So let me let me expand. Um, we used to think that that say the goldenrod that is blooming right now it dies, you know, dies back after several frosts and it becomes a, a dead stalk there. That that's where the bees were uh, nesting this year, but it turns out that's where they will nest next year. So there's a year delay in there. And it also turns out that they do most of their nesting in those pithy stems within about two feet of the ground. So if you took off, you know, if you've got a five foot goldenrod stem and you took off three feet, um, it makes it a, a little, little tidier, but you can leave areas that uh, would still be effective housing for, for those bees next year. But this is one of the reasons that we say if you have a meadow and you're trying to um, maintain a good habitat for what lives there, you don't mow it or burn it every year. Uh, and you don't mow it or burn all of it at once. You burn a third or mow a third and a third and a third so that any one spot is only treated once every three years. 
So the two thirds of your meadow that you don't treat is still there and can recolonize the third that you do treat. Nothing is going to survive a burning or, or mowing. So there's no way to do that. It doesn't matter when you do it, you're going to, uh, you're going to kill what's there. You, if you're, when you do mow, you don't want to mow in the fall because all of the things that produce seeds that will support our sparrows and juncos and things that come down from, from the north all winter long, you'll lose them in the fall. If you, so do that, do that in, in uh, early spring end of February, March, as soon as you can get out there uh, when the snow is gone, if we ever get snow again. <laughs> um, but again, a third, a third, a third. And people say, well, woody plants come in. They do. Our, you know, That's what succession is around here. It wants to become a forest because we get so much rain. So you have to spot treat. And most of those woodies will be invasive plants around here. So you spot treat. And mowing never controls invasives because it does not kill the root system. Um, so spot treating uh, is is the way to maintain your 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 meadow from woodies um, without mowing constantly. Fantastic. We have a question from Betsy. How do cultivars of native plants impact the insect population? Do they also support any insects? Um, the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on what the genetic trait. Uh, that was selected for in the cultivar mm -hmm. is. So first of all, m many cultivars weren't selected at all. They're simply natural variants that were found in nature. Uh, something like, like um, Acer rubrum October glory. That is a, it's a red maple that has really red foliage and it was simply found in nature and somebody brought it in put a name on it and then they started cloning it and and you know it so it seemed like oh we selected for this really red foliage well it was it was natural so um, is that supporting insects as well probably uh, but there's two types there's there's um, genetic traits that address the plant in all different ways but not the flower and then there's all these these cultivars that focus on flowers we did a study uh, that was uh, funded by Mount Cuba Center looking at six traits that address the plant, not the flower. Um, so it, it was, you know, plant structure, plant habit, uh, what happens when you take a tall plant and make it short, what happens when you introduce disease resistance, when you enhance uh, berry size, when you enhance full color, when you have variegated leaves. The only one that made a difference to insect populations was when you take a green leaf and make it red or purple. Um, we grew these in a common garden. It was a highly controlled experiment. That introduced anthocyanins into the leaf and that those are feeding deterrents. So red leaf cultivars are really popular for some reason. I personally think they're all ugly, but a lot of people like them. Uh, but that is the cultivar that is guaranteed to hurt the things that eat leaves. But the other traits didn't, didn't have any consistent uh, effect. Annie White at the University of Vermont is looking at uh, what happens to flowers when you enhance flower size or you make it a double flower or all the things we do to flowers. And the news isn't quite so good there. Typically that messes up, uh, particularly the relationship with specialized pollinators, uh, which makes sense. They became specialized because of the traits that are on that flower uh, and, and always are there in the straight species. When we change all them, it, it, it messes things up. Not 100%, there are cultivars that support as many pol uh, pollinators, but um, chances are good that a cultivar of a flowering plant is gonna have fewer pollinators. You can test it yourself. You can just sit there and, and count the ones that come in. But uh, if you wanna be sure, try to go for the, the straight species. The thing that bothers me the most about cultivars is that they're typically propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variability. and that. That's not what we want these days. With the extreme weather events, all the craziness that's going on out there, our plants are going to be able to handle it because they've got genetic variability. If we load the landscape with plants with no genetic variability, we already know that's not a good idea. Understood, thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question here. Um, Lara and Brian want to know, are there varieties of plants that would be better to grow in a home with a vegetable garden to support insects? Should flowers be included in a vegetable garden? Um, yes. <laughs> the, more, the more diverse your vegetable garden is, if you have the space and the amount of sun, um, the, uh, the lower the pest level. 
I mean, that's that's been demonstrated a number number of times. Let me give you a quick uh, example. Even if you don't have flowers in and around your vegetable garden, but if you have your vegetable garden in a landscape with a lot of native plants, you're supporting the natural enemy community that will help control some of the pests that you have. Remember, a lot of the pests in vegetable gardens, things like the cabbage white butterfly are introduced pests themselves. They're here without most of their natural enemies. Um, but out of the native pests we have, things like tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm, that's a native insect. Um, it's a sphinx moth and they're attacked by braconid wasps uh, that make those white cocoons on their back. The larvae of the wasp has already eaten out the inside of the caterpillar and then they tunnel through the, the, the integument and, and spin a cocoon on the back. Everybody thinks they're eggs, but that caterpillar is already essentially, he's the walking dead there. Well, that's a natural enemy that helps control those. Where does it come from? It comes from other populations of sphinx moths. At my house, or at our house, we've got 17 species of sphinx moths. So when the tobacco hornworm comes on our tomatoes, there's already a big population of these braconid wasps there, ready to go, ready to hammer it. But if you have no other sphinx moths around you, then um, you don't have any braconid wasps and it usually strips all your tomatoes before they, they actually find it. So that's a benefit of having natives around you. That uh, That's just an example, but that's how that, that would work. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer some of these questions, Doug. We really appreciate it. I want to, yeah, I truly do. I want to um, just pass it back over to Fritz here for a few closing thoughts um, before we wrap up tonight's Special Nature Hour. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Doug. Creating landscapes in which nature thrives. So life as we know it depends on insects, the little things that run the world. The insect population is collapsing and in turn, the bird population is declining. The creatures that support our life on earth are heading toward extinction and yet this evening, Doug, you've outlined a path forward. Your research, your writing, your willingness to speak to audiences like us and your actions on your property are making a difference. The rest is up to us, each of us as individuals and as a community. The Chickadee Research Project in suburban Washington, D.C. demonstrated that we need at least 75% of our plants to be native to support insect populations that in turn support bird populations. The types of plants we have in our landscapes matter. Creating habitats in our yards and neighborhoods matter. So if you're wondering what your next step should be and still have questions to be answered, I wanna refer you to Lancaster Conservancy's Community Wildlife Habitat page at lancasterconservancy.org where you can get lists of invasive plants you should remove immediately, lists of appropriate native plant replacements, a list of local contractors that can help you transform your property that came up in the Q&A this evening, and you can sign up to have a free site assessment where a trained volunteer will come and visit your home to walk your landscape and answer your questions. That's Lancaster Conservancy's Community Wildlife Habitat Initiative. Doug, your presentations always give me pause they always lead me to Google a new term or word. Uh, and most importantly, they inspire me and help me realize that I, and in turn, we can play a vital role in creating landscapes in which nature thrives. With that, I wanna thank everyone who joined us this evening. I wanna encourage you to get out in your gardens this fall and have a wonderful evening and be well. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Fritz.